I'm really happy to have four interesting panelists here today from different countries and different types of mobility platforms. So we have two representatives of ride-sharing platforms. We have Marcus Barnacle from carpooling.com. We have um, Guillaume Ver Verag from the ride-sharing platform Django. Then we have Mar Alarcon from the peer-to-peer -peer car sharing social car. And we have Osil Stav, who's a service designer. So um, just to give you a little background, the reason we decided to do this panel is because the mobility sector is undergoing a profound transformation. And so collaborative consumption business models like ride sharing and peer-to-peer -peer car sharing have emerged to meet these new challenges. And things like urbanization and democratic, um, demographic changes are leading us to have to rethink new mobility concepts and also intermodal concepts. And that's some of the concepts that we want to talk about in more detail together. And so intermodal transport, just so everyone knows what that means when we're talking about that, Intermodal transport is when we use different types of transportation and combine them. So I don't just try to get somewhere with a train, but also combine that with the car or an airplane. So now to get started, um, it would be great if everyone could shortly say a couple sentences about themselves and present the specific service or platform you're working on. And so uh, Guillaume, how about you start? Hi. Um, so. Uh, we develop a carpooling solution for companies in Belgium. Uh, we start in Belgium. It's really a platform that helps people to daily go to the work. It's really a home work uh, platform facilitator. Facilitator. So it's really um, the companies buy the, the project for the feel good for the employees and to help them uh, to incentivize them to go to work. Uh, that's really what we are focused. Uh, it's really about uh, trying to increase the percentage of people doing uh, the step to share their daily uh, commute with colleagues from the same company or from companies beside them. Thanks. Um, Mar, maybe you want to continue? Uh, hi, I'm Mar Alarcon. I'm the founder of socialcar.com. That is the, the first peer-to-peer uh, -peer car sharing platform in Spain. And by the moment we launched it in 2011, is the only one. So we are alone, that is good, but sometimes we have to shout very high. And uh, this, uh, with this, this uh, we are operating through a platform, online platform, where car owners can safely rent their cars to their neighbors. And uh, we focus on providing the right insurance for doing that and providing um, as much as uh, warranties and, and, and trust to our users. Thanks. Um, Marcus? Yes, hello. My name is Marcus Barnacle. I'm working for carpooling.com. Um, we are the largest ride-sharing platform in Europe. Um, we have been moving over 40 million people uh, across Europe, roughly 1.1 million people per month at the moment. And what we do is we help uh, make better use of the uh, largest infrastructure that is you know, crisscrossing through our veins and cities, which are cars. Uh, and when a car is being moved, usually there's, you know, one person in it, and it's actually not being moved for 90% of the time. So we're making those seats bookable, and that at a very affordable rate. And that's the, the business we're in. Thanks. Uh, Osil? Yeah, I'm Osil Stav. I'm uh, working as a service designer for a utility sector, InfoShare. Uh, we are working as a service design company, uh, providing better services for um, stakeholders and better user experiences. What does that mean? Yes, it means that we're actually creating future scenarios, uh, imagining and uh, how it can be in the next years, next decades, whatever the company is demanding and what the user needs. Uh, we also have working for um, we created an uh, application uh, for uh, public um, um, parking. So it's a community where the P2P are sharing, where it's free parking spaces. So this is where the company started. And then we worked in towards the mobility. And we have worked with RATP, SNCF, 
to create future scenarios for the users. Great. So as you just already mentioned, the user is a very important element when you're looking at transport and new forms of shared mobility. So I'd like to know from all of you and your different platforms, what demographic are your users from and why do they use your service? So what is the added value they see? And also, uh, what is their behavior and, and how they utilize it? So is it a substitution for uh, another type of transport they were already using? Or is it just like an addition, something they use once in a while because it's more practical? Uh, maybe Mar, you'd like to start? Uh, well, our, at the beginning we thought that our users will be online users, but, uh, but no, we see that uh, our users are uh, on the driver's side. Anyone who has a driving license could be our user, and anyone who owns a car could be our, our user. So uh, it's quite anecdotic, but <coughs> sorry. Uh, we have um, uh, owners that they are not able to use internet at all, and they come to the office when they have to accept the, res the reservations. This is anecdotic, but this happens because uh, these people have an, have an, had understand, they understood the, the benefits of this. On the owner side, of course, the economic benefit, this is the first thing they, s they see on this service. But when they try it, they, they become attached very, very quickly because they see other benefits. And from the driver's side, uh, the, the benefits we are giving to them or the, 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 the positive things are that we are offering a car next door, so proximity is very important, and also that we are offering a huge range of, of cars, cars that you cannot find in another uh, option. So, and somehow it's uh, alternative and uh, alternative and also um, people is, uh, um, uh, our, our services is, is, is substituting other, other, other transport as train or whatever. So in this side, both are the, the users. Yeah, Marcus? Uh, well, when we started the business um, 12 years ago, it was mainly students that uh, came to the side because uh, they've seen it as a very you know, affordable way to get from A to B. Our sweet spot is really anywhere between 150 to 250 kilometers. You know? So we're connecting cities. We're much less within the city, more in between cities. Now, our core demographics today are between 24 and 36 a little bit more female than male, higher income, higher education. Um, but it's really anyone who would like to go from A to B. And the, you know, the major drivers are, you know, it's an affordable way to traffic, uh, to, to go from A to B. It is, um, you know, easy to book and it's safe and convenient. You know, and that's, um, that of course makes us, uh, you know, if you want to a replacement to some of the other major modes of transport. But we started to integrate uh, trains and buses and planes to our offering, because consumers came to our side and said, we want to get from A to B, and we really want to have it in a way that is easy to book and convenient and, of course, affordable. And it's a good extra benefit for them to see trains and buses and ride sharing side by side. So this way we became one of the largest seller of train tickets as well in Europe. Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting aspect that we'll also talk about later more in detail. But um, just one follow-up question. So. Is, are people using ride sharing as their primary form of transportation or is it more of an addition of, of some like occasional travel? Well, some do, you know, we have all different kinds of travelers. Some would take it to their daily commute back to work, you know. Some would say, you know, every weekend I'm working in the, uh, in the city, but I'm living a little bit far outside the city. So on Mondays I'm commuting in, on Fridays I'm commuting out. So they would be, you know, weekly or bi-weekly users. You know, you have people who are going on vacation and they're doing this every three or six months and they would be using our service. So because we're moving over a million people a month now, you know, you can't really specify a certain specific Use, uh, user case. You know, it's the same reason why people would step on a plane or step on a train. Okay. Guillaume? Yeah, for our, our side, at the beginning we thought that a uh, student would be a, uh, a good target, but uh, finally the, the flexible flexibility on the agenda was maybe too difficult to, to, to carpool the daily and to organize themselves. It's, it's, that's asked too much time to, uh, for the student, but Right now, our users are really people who are doing the same trip every day for more than 30 kilometers. They don't want to be alone, so they are open to try and to, to meet other people. And in fact, when they start and when they do once, uh, 
that change and a lot of times they, they continue, they still continue and often without using our platform because they, they know the colleagues uh, and then uh, we did our job. So we connect people and, uh, uh, but yeah, for the user it's more people, for employees, for services company, pharmaceutical company, so higher uh, more services companies and um, yeah, that, that's it. Yeah, and um, fr from your experience, because you said it was very hard to convince people or a large percentage of people to actually use these services. So what do you think, or from your experience, has been the, the decisive reason why people said, cool, I'm going to try this ride sharing and really want to do it? I think it's communication. Uh, even if the company, communication inside the company, because uh, we are targeting quite huge companies, it's quite difficult too. So we have to convince companies and then they have to convince the employees. So uh, I think it's one moment the information uh, that the employees say, okay, I will, I will try. I think it's only trying. So if we can uh, do more uh, uh, creative on the communication, if that's what we try to do. I think it's only trying and, and then, uh, and then it, it, it works. Um, yeah. Okay, um, so now I'm gonna take maybe a step back to look at the broader developments in mobility and maybe, Oshi, you'd like to say something about the big uh, mobility challenges that we're facing or going to face in the next years and also why it's so important that we look at these new alternative mobility options. Uh, yes, it's, uh, we are heading towards uh, an urbanization that it's so like more and more people are working in city, are moving into cities and in 2050, it will be 70% of all population will live in cities. So it's kind of a governmental issue. It's also like uh, regarding everyone because it's uh, meaning that we have to change <laughs> not just the transport because the transport is a part of the urbanization and the urban development. So the whole thing will be that it all should almost be trial cities where you can try out new ways of living, new ways of transportation. It's kind of a collaboration between uh, the urban development, the government, uh, everything that infrastructure is in the city. And more and more it will be more uh, computer data technology and everything and users, it's, they are intelligent and that sometimes we forget that because actually more and more th they will be involved in what's going on. They are tweeting, they're making communities and they are starting this like you guys started peer to peer services and this will come more and more that the, the focus will be on the service and if the government doesn't include that in their processes then they will be left behind and they will be really like, uh, at one point you say, shit, we are a bit late actually, we haven't thought about that. And that's something that is really important to include the users the whole way and to focus on that. And um, you have some places like in Zürich, I think they're, they're doing uh, more because it's barriers between different transportation. Now it's complicated that maybe the trains, the train is working together with the air, airlines and uh, yeah, this different kind of transportation. And this, they have to cut down the bar barriers. And that's what they did in Zurich. They are proposing the collaboration between, for example, a VELIP system together with a transport system. And this kind of like, okay, yes, I'm open to, to collaborate. Uh, and now, if for example, in Zürich, they have like 70% uh, is walking and biking because they have identified the distance. It's like for short distances, you should walk or bike. For a bit longer, you're using uh, common transport. For long, long distance, you use car sharing uh, or um, airplanes. So it's kind of also to identify different needs the user have and kind of come with the best proposal because the users will always choose the best solution. They don't care if they're owner or not. They will choose the best solution for them. So this is also the, the main thing. And also to have, uh, would be an important thing is to allow the user to have one way of payment, for instance. Like I know in Hong Kong, they have a card. They use the same card for all transport types. So they don't need to say, okay, I'm going to develop thing. I need a card for that. I'm going to take the metro. I need a Navigo card for that to really integrate all kind of payments and in one system. Yeah, so, so that's also something we're gonna discuss briefly yeah. later. Um, but so 
if any of you maybe also would like to say something about the big mobility challenges you see in the next years and also um, the relationship of those challenges to the topic of intermodal transport and the opportunities that you already mentioned, Marcus, and how these different services can become intermodal and integrate with other forms of transport. Maybe you want to start, Mark. Yeah, I think we, you know the, the, the sometimes the industry is just behind the uh, lacking behind the consumer need, and what consumers would like to see today is if we are starting here at this um, you know location and um, going back to your to your home, you know your your trip will you know consist of at least four different travel segments. It's the first one maybe to the Gare de l'Est from Gare de l'Est to, I don't know, to the next train station, and then you will not live at the train station, highly unlikely, you probably live a couple miles away from that, so you have another trip section. And, um, you know, it, it's technically possible to integrate all these different uh, modes of transport, although, you know, even some of the largest carriers in Europe still do not have an API or XLM feed, which means, although they are willing to share the data, you know, we would need to crawl them or integrate their Excel sheets, which is, for the customer, horrific experience, because once they try to figure out a schedule, it's not going to be up to date. And so now they're all working on that, but it's going to take some time. And uh, the next challenge will be ticketing. So I would love to now buy one ticket from here to my home. But what I, I need to do instead is I probably have to buy four different tickets with four different sign-up processes. One accepts PayPal, the next one only credit card, the other one the direct debit. And you spend you know, 25 minutes to you know, book one trip instead of two, uh, which it should be. Um, so intermodality uh, as a concept is something everybody you know, is working on and would like to see. Unfortunately, um, you know, because of those challenges, you know, it probably takes uh, a little bit more time. But I can just uh, very much rely to what you've said, that the, the challenges within the urban environment, and today you know, we have the, the biggest migration in mankind happening, where over five million people each month move from you know, the, the countryside into cities. And we're in Europe, that has already happened to the main part, but we're looking at other markets where this is happening now. And with the density in those places, you know, we need to come up with new solutions um, to work on mobility. And we believe that um, you know, what has happened in the airline industry, in the train sector, where you know, when you take a trip today, most of the time when you're on a plane, the plane is fairly well booked. You know, I remember when I was, uh, you know, a teenager, a teenager when I was flying on holiday. I could virtually lay down in the middle aisle because there were so many empty seats. That's over because they have all had to optimize their businesses. They're now working on that and they're more profitable. But one part of mobility where that has not happened at all is the automotive. You know, 80% of the cars are moving around with one person in it, and that's creating a lot of trouble in the urban environment. So that needs to be addressed. Yeah. So, um, Guillaume, what, what do you think? Is intermodal transport something that, w that we need, or how do you think that should be integrated in the future? Um, yeah, I think maybe a little bit differently. Uh, I don't know, for, there is like, as you said, different uh, segment of the, the mobility uh, for carpooling.com is more uh, between cities and of course uh, in France if you want to go in the south by train or by plane it, it costs a lot so of course we will see alternatives and then you can link between train and uh, and cars it makes sense uh, um, but for for the challenge more inside the city um, me I, I'm living in Brussels for example and then from one year uh, since two years I, I left I, I uh, sell my car and I try to to not using the car but using all the alternatives and um, it, it's, it works pretty well uh, and when I told abo about it uh, with my all the person in Brussels it's just about communication because they they still feel that uh, having a car is is a freedom uh, I think is the, is the opposite and the, the intermodality is already there um, okay there is like a good, good ticketing uh, or, or uh, don't have like a, lo a lot of payment solution for all the stuff that that's a, that's a good stuff. But after that, more of uh, it's more about communication. About yes, it's possible, and yes, you have the the velo, you have the bus, you have you can walk, uh, and maybe later ride sharing uh, real time inside the city. Maybe in some years. Uh, but so for me, the challenge in the environment of the city is really the communication. Mark. 
Yeah, well, I, I agree a little bit uh, with Marcus. Uh, I think that intermodal transport it's a good it's a challenge. It's a good solution, but it's a, it's a challenge because we need to unify lots of pieces, and and some of them are run by public administrations and. This is, is quite complicated, but also I agree with him that we will always need the car because of this freedom or the, maybe the train system in one country is not, is not enough or, or, or it's not running well, so that happens in Spain, and you, al you always need a car. So this, this will, will uh, we, we, we had to combine all these uh, different transports and different options as peer-to-peer -peer carpooling, whatever. But to, to match them, it's, it could be a good solution, but it would be difficult to do it. Yeah, so since we're going to do uh, some questions at the end, just so the audience is alerted and starts thinking of what they'd like to ask, um, I'd like to now also use the opportunity, since we have um, you from Norway and France, Belgium, Spain and Germany here, um, that you could all briefly just talk about what you think the differences are between the countries and the approaches to mobility, uh, how much influence the government has and private companies, what their different relationships are to mobility, and also the concept of the smart city, how that really plays into the, the mobility landscape in the different countries. Um, maybe, Marcus, you want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, so, m our experience is we are operating now all across Europe, and um, there is a big difference in the way government approaches, uh, you know, the the support or the you know the initiatives that you know that, you know very much tied to our business. Where, if I might just compare maybe France and Germany, you know, I don't claim to be an expert. Just what I'm observing is in France, I'm seeing a lot of government initiatives. You know, when you walk through Paris, you can't miss the Vili Potuli. You know, initiative. I think there's a national carpooling day in France, and uh, there's a lot of activity around that. And you can see that you know the government virtually communities. I think there's some law where you know companies are you know actually obligated to reduce traffic to their work site, and you know which is great. Other markets are much more grassroots driven. You know, in, in Germany, you see a lot of uh, initiatives actually come out of you know out of the citizens, much more citizen movements. You know, we had car sharing 40 years ago, and it was very much uh, you know a, a citizen-driven uh, initiative where they actually used um, the parking spaces at churches in the city because they're you know only being used on Sundays, and they said, why wouldn't we you know leave a couple of cars there? We don't take extra space, and then you can share it. Great, and, um, and today there's a couple more you know car sharing services in the, uh, across Germany. Then you have markets like, you know, like Poland, where the government uh, you know, is now trying to improve infrastructure, but really um, you can see that uh, you know, a concept like ride sharing uh, is very much known, not because it existed before, but people were actually hitchhiking together. You know, there were spaces where people could meet and uh, you know, next to the highway, because uh, there was not enough uh, infrastructure on the train, or not everybody could afford a car, so they met up and they did hitchhiking in a way that's not very safe. So at when we started, they called us virtual hitchhiking, you know, because that was very close to their, um, to their heart. And, um, but in most markets we go in, uh, it's really very much consumer driven, you know. I think you just mentioned that the, uh, the relationship of, you know, especially people in cities to their car has changed quite dramatically. And uh, a lot of research shows that when people think about freedom in the past, it meant to own a car, you know, to see your friends, to venture out and about, to get away from your home and your parents pretty much. That has changed now because with your smartphone, you can achieve that, you know. And Forster did a research and said, you know, if you had to choose, you know, this question, what would you take? Uh, would you ever take a smartphone or car, you know, and 80 percent of 18 to 24 year olds said the smartphone. Now that's very impressive because a smartphone costs anywhere between 300 and 650 euro, whereas a car obviously costs much more. But the, the smartphone and the access to mobility has really replaced the car. At the same time, you know, young adults don't mind cars. It's just the baggage that comes with only a car from gas to parking spaces, you know, to traffic jams. That's the part they don't like. But if you share it, you get access to it, you know? People love, love taking cars, so. So, so Oshi, um, what, what is your view on this? No, I totally agree about this. Uh, I think, okay, we're just talking about the car, basically, here, <laughs> and I was just thinking that, and of course, in uh, owning a car, everyone had maybe a dream, yeah, one day I will have a car, and you, you have this freedom and everything, but if, 
if you actually add a value and create something with this kind of sharing idea, people will buy it if, it, if it's worth it. If you, if you count how much you earn per year, I mean, how much money you save and how much, uh, and you find kind of, maybe you're living in a flat and you have kind of neighbors, you have, and five people are, five neighbors are sharing the same car. Maybe they find a solution, this kind of thing. And this is something will, I think will come more and more that in a community or in a certain local area, you will have public, maybe places where you can um, wash your clothes, where you can uh, rent a car. So it will not be just in a global thing. It will be more also smaller community that kind of are sharing this kind of uh, services. And if you create the value and kind of involve the users in why they would choose uh, a service instead of owning a car, then they also are saying, yeah, I said that, I want, this is what I need, or this is something. And so w what has your experience been in Norway in comparison to other countries? Uh, yeah, in Norway, it's, uh, we, I mean, public transport is used a lot. Uh, when it comes to kind of uh, carpooling and all this stuff, it's not so, I mean, it's used, but it's not so much because when you come to Norway, you have distances that it's so, it's complicated. <laughs> I mean, so most, it's a lot of people have cars. So it's a whole shift there that it's the, the government is taking this kind of issue serious and they're building it better transport lines and everything. But we have so many fjords, it's really complicated. You don't get the train up there because then you have to make tunnels, blah, blah, blah. So it's really, a com we have the money and we have the open government and it's really easy to get the data dialogue between the different companies and the government. So right now it's, it's uh, people are investing in the transport systems to create better systems. Yeah. So Mar, tell us a little bit more about Spain and the situation there. Well, uh, in Spain, for example, uh, our service is running quite well in cities where the public, transpor tra public transport is running well. So because uh, our cities where people can uh, not own a car and they have the alternative of renting a car when they need it and they have the public transport. In, in places where uh, public transport is not running well, everyone has a car. So we can have lots of owners, but we don't have drivers. So, and uh, regarding the administration, they are very keen on talking about uh, smart cities, and, uh, but they focus only on, car, on traditional car sharing. And traditional car sharing, uh, they are putting fl uh, new fleets on the uh, cities, they are occupying a uh, new space, and, and this is mm, somehow uh, we are already using what we already have, and we are optimizing space. So, and we are not very supportive on this, uh, our initiative, maybe because we are already small, but, uh, but it's, it's quite more, have a more, se more se common sense. And they are more, very interested in putting electric cars and, and more cars, more cars, and this is not, uh, I think this is not the right behavior. Guillaume? Um, in Belgium, um, Belgium is, is a small small country and we have quite good infrastructure. Uh, there's train, b a bus, uh, uh, tram, metro in the cities. Um, but we have, I think, the worst tra the traffic jam every day uh, as we focus on uh, everyday carpooling. It's, it's totally amazing. Uh, if you want to enter in Brussels in the morning, on, it's, quite, it's, it's a mess. And uh, even if there are solutions, uh, as a train, a lot of people uh, want to use their car. There is like plenty of reason. Uh, and uh, the government, or how the government, because there is like Wallonia, Flanders, two, two things different. Uh, they know about it and they want to do something. Um, but I don't think that that's, a, that's a, not, not a good uh, uh, information right here. Uh, they, they want to do something for the carpooling uh, for Wallonia. I think it, they start to do a project and this project will take maybe three years to, to, to come in. So really like too, too, too long term uh, solution. Um, so yeah, we have huge problem in mobility and not a lot of answer by the government if, if it was a question. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, so before we move on to the questions, just really briefly, can each of you in one sentence or maybe one and a half Say your vision for the future of, of mobility in the next 20 years. Um, Mara, you want to start? 
<laughs> I don't know, but I think that on the following years, mobility has to be based on common sense, on, on, on using, using, using transport on, based on, on this, on common sense, not, n not now, not, not what we have now, at least in my country. No? Lots of uh, public transport that they are not running well, lots of uh, smart cities or uh, new initiatives, and we have to put everything you know, in, in, a, in, in good combination. Guillaume? Uh, if we talk about mobility in, in the cities, I would say that the future is when you want to move, uh, at that time you can select maybe some seconds before uh, the, and with the mood that you are at the moment, you can uh, move in the city. And uh, I think that will be the future. Thanks. Was you? Uh, I think the user will decide, actually. I think all the decision will be more made on what the user experiences. It will go, we'll go from public and private uh, mobility to shared mobility. Uh, it will move also more into so social mobility, finding solutions that, for instance, you have uh, elderly people who need to use public transport, but maybe they can't. So we have to find specific solutions for different groups. So we have to really know all our users and find their kind of um, needs. And also uh, the government and um, the private sector will have to collaborate and cut down the barriers. So we'll move from kind of uh, inter-mobility um, to more uh, a user-centered mobility. Thanks. Marcus? Well, I think, you know, right now most of the concepts we're seeing of the new concepts for mobility are very much catered to cities. And I think you said it before, today 50% still of the world population lives in cities, but it means 50% live outside of cities. So the future will need to bring solutions that really cater not only to people within cities, because there we have a lot of uh, existing infrastructure, but actually to people living on the countryside. And I think the best role that the government could play is to, you know, to, to get the legal and the financial and actually the uh, insurance environment that these services can operate in a proper way and to grow. I think that's, that's the future of mobility. Thanks. Okay, so now we're going to take two questions and uh, two people can an answer each one. Do we have any questions? Okay. Um, yeah. So hello, my name is Katina Schneider and I'm working for a ride-sharing startup company based in Heidelberg, Germany. And I have a similar vision as uh, you, uh, Guam, <laughs> um, in that uh, I th we're after spontaneous uh, ride sharing. And, and you mentioned that you're um, looking or you're targeting larger businesses, which is very logical because they produce a lot of the traffic mornings and evenings. My question is, um, how, how are you approaching these businesses? Um, we, we, we approach them uh, <laughs> um, just by by trying to convince them that they have to do something for the mobility, they have to be responsible, they have a role, a role to play, but also, uh, um, yeah, because there, there is something in the air right now, so we are mixing also in the, on the, the green stuff that we can, they can bring also to the employees. Uh, different companies react differently, it's, uh, it's depend on the culture of the companies, and so it's really, uh, different uh, case, case by case. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Nicola, um, actually a student. And I have a question for you, Guillaume, as well. As um, you said before that once the people are connected to the, together, like they will not use your platform, so um, what is your strategy to avoid this problem is like to get, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, what was it? Um, in fact, that's not so bad that they, they don't they do. So that's the, the political that we are uh, saying to the companies. Okay, when you are c people are connecting, so we did our job. 
but there is like different services inside the platform that we uh, deliver, like uh, events for companies uh, uh, that you connect, uh, also gamification about, okay, knowing other people, sometimes uh, doing carpooling with others. Uh, there is also uh, turnover inside the companies. Uh, so finally, if the companies are happy, they stay with us uh, the, the year after. Um, hi, I'm Louis. I'm a student from Munich. Uh, my question is a little bit more t tourism related. Um, how do you see like the impact of like those shared mobility services on the mobility for tourists in the future? Well, um, we see actually this happen already now. You know, we uh, when you think of, I think a couple of years back when people were going across Europe. You know, you know when I was a student, I took Eurorail or Interrail, I think it was called back then, to go to all the different places. And this was a pure tourism reason to move across or uh, you know weekend destinations, city travel. You know, people going skiing holidays. Now that's all happening on ride sharing today. You know, a it's more flexible, it's cheaper. Uh, you can book it out of your pocket, um, and uh, you know it's a, a safe new way of transport. So uh, the reason why people travel could be tourism, could be business, could be you know seeing family and friends, and uh, all these reasons are the reasons why that that fill at least our platform. So um, yes, um, tourism is a very important part, and for um, a lot of um, cities are now considering actually to build really well lit meeting points for car sharing. Uh, drop-offs and pickups because they know this is such a large volume. We have every three second uh, a trip starting across Europe, you know, but they, they have to meet somewhere. And cities are now uh, realizing the volume of trips that are, you know, starting and ending in their places. And to be more attractive, you know, they are starting now to consider this as a, you know, as a good, well-lit meeting point and differentiating themselves from other cities. So it's, it's starting to, um, you know, arrive at the minds of the people who plan tourism also for our cities. Mar, do you want to answer as well? Yeah, for me the impact is very easy. Is uh, the impact we will have in some years is that we are changing bef behaviors. We are, we are changing minds. We are showing the people that they don't need to possess everything. You don't need to possess a car to to use it only the two percent of the time. So you can have access to the use. You know? So it's a sharing economy stuff. No? So this is our impact. Thanks a lot. So we're perfectly in time. Um, we can do one more urgent question. Not really a, a question. It's more about uh, some more information because uh, I'm coming from Berlin and there will be a bahn uh, 25. That means you have a reduction on the trains. You could book on it uh, for the buses and you can use uh, call a bike and car sharing with it. There will be a, a little credit on it for car bike, um, call a bike and car sharing. So it would start right now. And for the tourists about in Paris, for example, we have still books for the Belieb to visit Paris by Belieb uh, with uh, attractions, uh, um, interesting points to see and how to use the Belieb in a good way, not to pay, uh, to pay too much of money. You want to, there is a last, maybe a very last question? Okay. Yeah, the time for yeah, I have a uh, hi, uh, I'm just wondering how, how come the sharing economy seems so um, uh, vibrant, I would say, um, in spite of the fact that it started with uh, sharing apartments and uh, it all, uh, I mean, do you know the, those apartments in Spain that were, you could re uh, share? And uh, it started on something that became uh, synonymous with a scam, uh, in a way. Uh, so, so how come it's thriving in spite of the fact that it's thriving on, on the ruins of the sharing apartments economy? Uh. Well, I, mean, I can try to answer this. We started 12 years ago, there was no sh apartment sharing. If you're referring to Airbnb, I'm not sure exactly you. 
Oh, you're talking about timeshare? Oh, okay. Well, timeshare was a commercial model f to sell rooms and to get money out of people, I think, which was, I don't think has anything to do with the uh, sharing economy. Maybe I have a wrong uh, understanding of the Maybe it's time the rot of, of it. Or maybe it's the origin the of the time sharing is the origin of everything, but the uh, sharing economy know. is quite different. But time sharing was a scheme to sell people, to lock them yeah. in with an annual commitment in you know, getting real estate. And, uh, but I can assure you this has nothing to do with the uh, sharing economy. No. Okay, thanks a lot, everyone. I hope you learned a lot about intermodal transport. I thought it was very interesting. And thanks to our guests, and give them a hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.